life of worship is very important. And as we head into this Christmas season, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll be looking at the most important question. I want to invite you to turn as we continue in worship to the Gospel of John in chapter 14. We're kind of in between series right now. Um, Pastor Chris just wrapped up Ecclesiastes last week. Next week we'll hit our Christmas series, which will be the songs of Christmas, uh, the songs that we find in Scripture uh, about Jesus and about His birth that surround His birth. Uh, And so we'll we'll hit that hit the ground running with that series next week. But today I want to focus on one question, the most important question. John's gospel, if I had to choose, is probably my favorite gospel. It's kind of like choosing your favorite kids. You don't really have a favorite kid. You might, but you probably shouldn't. But a gospel, do you have a favorite gospel? Maybe. Maybe you should. Maybe you shouldn't. I do. I really like the gospel of John. I like the way John writes. I like the way that John, in the beginning, the first half of his gospel is uh, the first 33 years of Jesus' life. And then the last half of his gospel is just one week in Jesus' life. What John is saying is that, you know, the first verse in John is goes all the way back to the beginning of creation and time and Jesus being all the way back in the beginning. But then when he gets to the midpoint of his gospel, he gets into this final week, this resurrection, death, burial, Jesus spending time with his disciples, grieving in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he really, really focuses in on that. And so that's one of the reasons why I really like John's gospel. And so that's where we'll be this morning. Um, As we head into this Christmas season, we know that life is going to get hectic. Uh, There are many more activities that we will be a part of that are not a part of our normal schedule. Uh, There's many more things that that we'll go to. We'll have parties. We'll have uh, shopping in stores that we wouldn't maybe normally do. Online shopping. There's just activity after activity. We just begin to fill our calendars with more stuff, which is not bad. But I think some at some point, we need to press pause and we need to think about what the most important question for us would be. Now, when we're younger, some of the most important questions for us, like if we're in elementary school, maybe the most important question for us is, where is my favorite toy? Or what am I going to eat for a snack? When we get a little bit older, maybe junior high or middle school, those questions become a little bit more mature, like, um, what am I going to do this weekend? Or who's going to be my best friend? And then we get into high school, and those questions again continue to mature. Uh, Who do I want to have a relationship with? Or what am I going to do for a a part-time job? How can I make more money? Or what kind of car can I get? What kind of car can I drive? Then we get into college, and those those questions again begin to mature a little bit more. Like, what am I going to do for a career? Am I going to be in that career for the rest of my life? Or who am I going to marry? And then as we continue to get older, those questions mature even more. When we get into the working age, we're like, when can I retire? Like, we may first be getting into the workforce. We're like, okay, what year can I retire? And we look forward to those days. And so those questions begin to mature. But I think the question we're going to talk about today is one that stays with us. It's one that is already mature. It's one that it always, uh, even as an elementary age child, to uh, whether you're 5 or 85, it's a question that we can remain the same and one that we can continue to ask. The one question that really matters, the one question that makes a spiritual, eternal significance in our lives for the rest of our lives, the one question that all other questions will eventually come back to, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Not who is Jesus to your parents or your friends or even your children, not who is Jesus or who do I want Jesus to be, but from a biblical perspective, Who is Jesus? And that's the answer we will seek this morning to the most important question that I think can be before us. So let's read in John's Gospel, chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that it teaches us and gives us a clearer picture of who you are. God, as we examine this most important question in our lives, I pray that you would help us to to grab hold of what a true biblical perspective, what a biblical answer to that question is. Help us to see Christ 
through your eyes, see Christ through Scripture, through the lens of Scripture, that we could know you more and make you known. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So who's Jesus? There's a lot of stuff out there that would tell you who Jesus is. Some people see Jesus as a fictional character, like someone you'd see on a TV show. You kind of see what they're doing, but you have no real interaction with them. You've got no connection to them. Um, some people see Jesus as strictly a historical figure. He was just somebody who lived a long time ago. Don't really concern me. I'm not really worried about him. They see Jesus maybe as Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. This this character that's far off, somebody that I don't really know about, not really worried about. He's just in history. And some people see Jesus as this religious leader or prophet. He was this guy who taught a lot of good stuff, and people did a lot of the stuff that he talked about. He had this large following with him, and then he just died. Kind of like Gandhi or Muhammad or Buddha, that all these guys were just religious leaders, and eventually they passed away. They died. And then another group of people may see Jesus as just a good moral example. Well, if Jesus taught all these good things, then this is how we need to live. That we just need to get in line with what Jesus taught, and we'll be okay. We'll be a good person if we follow what Jesus taught. But then I think even as believers, we can sometimes have an incorrect view of Jesus. We may see Jesus as a vending machine, that if we put in the right amount of coins, if we put in the right amount of stuff, then we'll get what we want. Or we see Jesus as Santa Claus, where we just go to him and he'll give us what we want as long as we stay off the naughty list. As long as we do good things, then God's just going to give us what we want. Or maybe sometimes we see Jesus as a genie, where he just grants every wish that we have. Like, we don't even have to do anything. As long as we just pray, God's just going to give me what I want, because that's what God does. And so I think sometimes we can have an incorrect view of who Jesus is. We miss the biblical perspective, the biblical view of who Jesus is. Our own knowledge can only get us so far, but it's only through the Holy Spirit and his illumination in our lives that we can get this true picture of who Jesus is. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples in Luke 9, verses 18 through 20. He says, now it hap- or it says, now that it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Even when Jesus was alive, people still really didn't know who he was. They were saying he was one thing, maybe he's another, not really sure. But then we see Jesus asking a question. But then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, of course, Peter, Peter's going to answer. But Peter says, the Christ of God. I think through that illumination of the Holy Spirit, Peter was able to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the one that they had been waiting for. So who is Jesus? In our text this morning, we see the answer to this question. As at this point in John 14, there's a lot that's been going on in Jesus' life and in his ministry. Thousands have been fed through just a small meal. Many have been healed of their ailments, of their afflictions. Demons have been cast out. People have been risen from the dead because of what Jesus has done. And that's what I love about John's gospel, is he has these clear pictures of who Jesus is. Again, John's just showing us how important it is who Jesus is. And so Jesus and his disciples, they're sitting in the upper room as we approach John 14. In the upper room, it's kind of their last you know, meal together, we'll say. We call it the Last Supper because it's their last time to be together. They're celebrating the Passover. And if you remember the Passover, that takes us all the way back to the book of Exodus where Moses goes before Pharaoh and says, God wants you to let his people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, they can stay. They're going to be slaves. And so God sends these nine plagues to the Egyptians. You know, there's the flies, the locusts, the fire falling from heaven. There's just all kinds of the Nile turning to blood. And there's just all kinds of stuff that God sends. And each time Pharaoh says, no, no, your people are not leaving. They're going to stay here until God sends the tenth plague. And that was the killing of the firstborn. And it wasn't just of people, but it was also of the livestock. But God told Moses that if you tell the people, if they will kill the perfect lamb, a perfect lamb, a spotless lamb, and put the smear of the blood over the doorpost of the house, as the death angel comes through Egypt, the angel will pass over that house, and those inside will be safe. 
And so that's where the Passover comes from. And it takes on so much more meaning when we see that in context of what Jesus was doing here with his disciples. Because he now is going to be that perfect lamb whose blood is going to be spilled. As they celebrated this supper, this Passover meal, Jesus breaks the bread and tells them, this is my body that is broken for you. And as they share the cup, Jesus says, this is my blood that it will be spilled for you. And so Jesus is letting them know the things that are going to happen. And this is where we find ourselves in John chapter 14. Because it's only through the shedding of blood that we are able to receive forgiveness, that we are able to have a right relationship with God. In chapter 13, Jesus kind of shows us the way of how we are to live, where he serves his disciples. He washes their feet. He takes off his outer garment, bows before them, takes off their sandals, and washes their dirty, grimy feet. He even washes Judas' feet. The one who's going to betray him. The one who, in a few short hours, is going to turn him over to the authorities. He still bends down and washes his feet. And he lets his disciples know, and he says, Hey guys, here's what's going to happen. One of you is going to betray me. And then he looks specifically at Peter, and he says, Peter, you are going to deny me. Before the rooster crows, you are going to deny me. And then we see in verse 14, he opens this this verse or this passage by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. This stuff is coming. This is what's going to happen. But let not your hearts be troubled. Fear not. Everything is going to be okay. He's offering them comfort. They have seen such unexplainable things, miracles, healings, incredible things that these guys have witnessed Jesus do. But they know something's not right. And Jesus offers them this peace and comfort. Let not your hearts be troubled. Things are going to happen, but let not your hearts be troubled. And he continues by telling them that, that, that God has prepared a place for them, that God has a great place for them. He's got a room for them. Now, sometimes we've interpreted this passage that we are going to have a great mansion when we get to heaven, and it's going to be as big as... It's going to be big because of the deeds that we've done here on earth. Well, that's not what Jesus is trying to say here. He's saying, there's room. You have a room. I am going to prepare a place for you that you can come and be where I am. It's not about how big the place is or what it's decorated with or what's going to be in the room. The fact is, is that Jesus is going to be there. That's what's most important. And that's what he's trying to convey to them. That where I am, you can be also is what he's trying to teach them. He's trying to give them this comfort that chaos is coming. They're going to be scattered. They're going to be, even if you get into the book of Acts, they're going to be um, in trouble with these same authorities because of what they're going to be teaching and preaching. But he's saying, let not your hearts be troubled. I am going to prepare a place for you. And I'll come take you. You you don't have to worry about it. I may leave for a little while, and Jesus says, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you with me. So you don't have to worry. They do, just like any of us would. I mean, I'm sure we would be feeling the same way. And he tells them, you know the way. You know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas. I still don't like that. I don't like that we call him Doubting Thomas. He had one One thought, one doubt, and was like, well, that's who he is. He's doubting Thomas. I don't like that. But Thomas pipes up, and I think he asks the question that all of us would be asking. Well, we don't know the way. How how do we get there? Like, you're telling us the way, but we don't know the way. How do we get there? And Jesus doesn't condemn him for that question, but he answers him and offers him an, an explanation and gives him the answer, which really for us is the answer to the question of who is Jesus. That he tells him that I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. He doesn't say, I'm a way to the Father, I'm a truth, or I am a life. He says, no, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no one else. It is me and me alone. And so Jesus first says that he's the way. He is the path that is to be followed. Have you ever been lost. I was talking with Don Creel after 
the first service, and he's like, yeah, you know, I got lost going to my deer stand once. And somebody else piped in and says, I got lost after I shot a deer and couldn't find it and then couldn't find my way out. But have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost, like you didn't get the right directions to somebody's house and you can't find it? Or maybe when you were younger, you got lost in the grocery store and couldn't find your mom? Like, have you ever been lost? When I was, uh, after my freshman year of college, I got to serve at a camp in, um, in Chaco Springs, Alabama, or just outside of Talladega. It was an RA camp. For those that, that may remember, that's Royal Ambassadors. Um, it used to be a big Southern Baptist thing that we would do. And so basically, it was a church camp for boys, uh, elementary and middle school age. And so we would have campers come in for a week, and we would do all sorts of stuff with them. We'd shoot bows and arrows. We'd shoot BB guns. We'd go on hikes um, up the mountains and down the mountains right where we were. Uh, it was just it was great. We had a great time doing that. The last week, uh, Michael and I were tasked with taking 13 high school students on a three-day hike. We were going to be dropped off in, in, uh, on the Chihaw Mountain, which is right outside of Talladega. It's the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. It's kind of where they're beginning. Uh, we were going to be dropped off, and then for three nights, we were going to be just hiking and camping. Like, that's all we had to do. We, we had food enough with us. We had everything we needed, and so we were, that was what we were supposed to do, or what we were going to do. GPS didn't exist at this time. This was 1997. Well, it may have existed, but it wasn't like it is today. Like, the military may have had it, and that would have been it. It wasn't in our hands like it is today. Cell phones weren't really a big thing. Thankfully, there was one uh, of our camp staff who had a cell phone. I think he was the only one who had a cell phone, and so we commandeered that for the week. Um, and so we, he dropped us off, and we walk into the woods. And as we're walking along, it's a beautiful hike. We're just having a great time. The guys are cutting up, uh, and we're just having fun. We even come to a ledge, and we look over. It's about a 200-foot drop into a gorge. Um, it's just beautiful. You can see birds flying down below and all the trees. Beautiful. We took lots of pictures. We even came upon a plane crash. Like, it was a little single-engine plane that had crashed probably 10 or 15 years before we had gotten there. And it, I guess because of the terrain, they just never removed all the metal and stuff, so it was still there. But it was, we were just having a good time. But that night, as we were fixing our dinner, Michael and I began to talk about the fact that we weren't seeing the things that we were supposed to be seeing. Like, our camp director had been on that hike, had been on that trail hundreds of times, and he knew everything he was telling us, okay, you look for this, look for this, look for this, and you'll know where you are. And we're like, we're not seeing those things. And if you've ever been, if you ever hiked the Appalachian Trail or any type of big trail like that, there's usually markers on trees. Like, the Appalachian Trail has white markers that are about 18 inches high and about 8 inches wide. And you just go from tree to tree, and you can know which path to take. And we were doing that. We could see the little markers, and we knew exactly where we were going. But we still weren't seeing these, the big things that we were supposed to be seeing this first day. So Michael and I, well, not Michael and I, me, I began to worry. I'm 19 years old, and I'm leading this group of high school students into the woods, and I got no idea where we are. Like, I'm like, Michael, I'm, I'm not sure where we are. And he's like, I'm not either. We didn't let the guys know at that point, but we we're like, okay. So we just went to bed that night and woke up the next day, and we're like, okay, well, we'll just keep going the direction we were going, and hopefully things will work out. So as we keep going that next day, we come to a sign. We're like, oh, great, because usually on trails like that, there's, every once in a while there'll be a big sign that says there's a gap here, there's a trail here, there's a waterfall up here, and it'll kind of point you in the direction. Well, we come to the sign, and we're like, oh, thankfully, there's a sign we can look at. And so the sign says that um, we were supposed to be going left. That was the direction that we were supposed to be going. And then we looked at each other, and we're like, that's the way we just came. Like, how, where do we go from here? Because we had no idea at this point. Because the, the plane crash, the, the ledge that we came to, were supposed to be like the last hour of the hike when we were supposed to walk out. And we're like, we got no idea where we are. And so thankfully, we had the cell phone, and we called the camp director. We're like, hey, can you come pick us up? So we were able to hike, find our way back out, not backtracking, but find our... He's like, okay, go this way, look for this, look for this. We actually found the trail and found where we were supposed to be at that point. And so we were able to walk out. But it was kind of harrowing for me. I'm 19 years old. I've got really no idea what I'm doing taking these guys camping. But it was, God really showed me a lot through that. That there's a path that we are to follow. Because what we realized is as we walked into the woods from the parking lot, there were two paths. There was one to the left and one to the right. We took the one to the left. That was not the right one, the correct one. The correct path was to the right. 
And our camp director had told us that, but we didn't pay any attention because we were 19 years old, right? We don't pay attention. We don't listen to instructions. And so we had gone the wrong way. But how many times do we find ourselves in that same place where we're lost? We, we don't know where we are. We don't have direction in our life, and we need help. We may feel completely lost and having no idea where we need to be. We may even feel like we're stuck or we're struggling or we're confused about which path we need to take. But Jesus tells us he is the way. He is the path that we are to follow. We can always look to him for our purpose and for our direction and which path to take. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. You probably memorized this maybe when you were younger. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. God will make straight our paths. He is the path. He is what we are to follow. We all start out lost, every one of us. We're all separated from God. We've all gone on our own path, trying to find our own way to God, and it has only left left us in destruction. But Jesus is saying here, He is the way. He is the path. He is the way that we get to the Father. He is the way that we get to spend eternity with God. He is the only way. He's not a way. There's not another way to God. There's one way, and it's him. So who is Jesus? He's the way. He is the way. The second thing Jesus tells us is that he is the truth. Now, truth in our culture today is a very hot topic, only it's not based on anything concrete. Your truth is your truth, is what society says, and my truth is my truth, and don't you tell me what your truth is, because I don't care. I only want my truth. What's true for me is true. What's true for you doesn't matter to me. There's nothing that we base that on. We don't use science, we don't use facts, or we try to use science, we try to use facts, we try to use biology, but it's all jumbled up and mixed up, and we've got no idea. We try to spin those facts and those biological things to make it fit our narrative and what our truth is. So there's nothing that we have that's solid, that's concrete to base our truth on. According to our society, truth changes, and and it's flexible. Truth can change based on our situation, our mood, our emotions, our opinions. The, The problem with this view is that there's no way to know what is actually right, what is actually true. As the truth, Jesus is the manifestation of all of God's promises. Not only does Jesus speak the truth, he embodies the truth. He is the source of all truth. He didn't just say that he would show us the truth or that he would teach us the truth or that he would model the truth. He did all of those things. But he's saying, I am the truth. I am the truth. Truth personified. He's the source of all truth, the embodiment of truth. And therefore, the reference point for everything else in culture, everything else in our world, he is the reference point. He is the plumb line. He is uh, what all things are to be compared to. He is the standard. And we find that in Scripture. That's how we know that he's the standard. We find it in his word and what he has told us about himself. And third, Jesus tells us that he is the life. Now, this life... It's not just a sense of being alive or dead, but rather fullness and abundance. A life that is real, a life that is genuine, a life that is internal, eternal. And and this is what he offers to anyone who calls on his name. Anyone who puts their faith and their trust in him, he's giving us life. And he gives us an abundant life. Jesus told his disciples in John 10.10, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is life, and he offers us a life that is abundant. But what does that mean? What does an abundant life mean? Over the last several years, I've really struggled with this idea, this thought of the abundant life. Because in our Western mindset, an abundant life means we have more stuff. That's what it means. To, to have an abundant life, we, we read books about it. We hear preachers talk about it all the time. If you have enough faith, God's going to give you everything that you want. That's more of the Santa Claus mentality of who Jesus is. That's not what we see the real Jesus. So what does the abundant life mean? When I went to Africa in 2015, 
we were literally going from hut to hut, mud hut to mud hut, sharing Jesus with people. We would share Jesus with the uh, chief of the village, and then he would allow us permission to go in his village and share. And so the thought came to me as I'm walking from village to village or hut to hut, how do these people live an abundant life? Like for us, we may think an abundant life is getting a Lamborghini and being able to drive it down the road. But these people in Africa have no idea what a Lamborghini is. They will never see one. They will never drive one. Their roads wouldn't, they, the Lamborghini couldn't make it on their roads. So what does an abundant life mean? What is Jesus saying that we have an abundant life in him? It's a spiritual life. It is an abundance of him. That's what the abundant life means, is that we have more of him. Yes, God may bless us with stuff, and that's fine, but we have to be careful that those things do not become the object of our affection, that Jesus remains the object of our affection, and those things that he gives us are just blessings that he wants to give us. But our wealth or our non-wealth is not, uh, does not teach us about God's love for us, whether we have more or whether we don't have anything. That doesn't mean God loves us more or loves us less. The abundant life is found in the abundance of Jesus. If you look to Jesus' life, if, if that was how it worked, if having more faith and loving God more meant we had more stuff, then Jesus would have been the richest person to ever live. Like he would have had everything he could have ever wanted. But he didn't. He was a traveling preacher who even said, I don't have a place to lay my head. Come follow me. And people did. He had nothing, but yet there was an abundance in his life, and he offers that same abundance to us. He didn't have a private jet to fly him from Nazareth to Jerusalem and back again. That was not his purpose. His purpose was to bring joy and peace and salvation to this world. The abundance Jesus offers is a spiritual abundance through a relationship with him. He is the only one that can truly satisfy us. He's the only thing that can, at our core, satisfy what we long for the most. We may seek money and power and pleasure, but those things will never satisfy us. They will never bring the abundance that Jesus is offering to us. And finally, in verse 6, Jesus mentions the exclusivity of the gospel. That only those can come to the Father through Him. That's the only way. He's saying, I'm the way, I'm the way, I'm the only way, I'm the only way that you can get to heaven. I'm the only way to the Father. It is only through me. John also wrote in John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's what Jesus is saying. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. There's two places, there's two ways to go. There's the abundant life found in Jesus, or there's the wrath of God in eternity. Which path do we choose? Jesus is saying, I'm the way. I'm the only way to this abundant life. If you want to go your own way, then you are going to experience the wrath of God. I don't want to do that. He's the creator of the world. I want the abundant life that Jesus offers. I want to know him more. And it's only through a relationship with Jesus that we are able to have that abundant life. It is only through a relationship in Jesus that we are to spend eternity, or that we are able to spend eternity with God forever. So the most important question for us, I think, it doesn't mature with us, whether we're 5 or 85, it's the same question for all of us. Who is Jesus? And I think for us to have a biblical perspective, we need to know who Jesus is to me. And it's not that I see Jesus as a Santa Claus or a vending machine or a genie, but I see Jesus as offering abundant life. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. There's nothing else. It's him and him alone. I'm going to invite Matt to come up, and he's going to close us in a song in just a moment. But my encouragement for us today is that as we look to this holiday season, that we would remember who Jesus is. It's easy to forget Jesus. It's easy to forget what he's done for us and the hustle and bustle and everything that's going on because we have so many parties to get to and family gatherings and presents to purchase. But my prayer for all of us is that we remember who Jesus is. 
from Scripture, not from who we think he is or who somebody teaches us he is, but who the Bible says that Jesus is. Let's focus on the real Jesus, the Jesus of Scripture, not some caricature that we create on our own, because our own imagination, our own mind thoughts can take us so far. But it's Jesus, it's Scripture that teaches us who truly He is. We need to ponder the question, who is Jesus? Let me pray for us. God, we come before you, and I pray that you would put this question on our hearts, that you would help us as we navigate through this world, through this holiday season, through the rest of our lives, that we would be sure of who you are. God, help us to constantly be reminded that you are the way, that you are the truth, and you are the life, that there is nothing else that can satisfy us, there is nothing else that can give us the abundant life, but it is you and it is you alone. God, you are wonderful and you are marvelous, and we do want to celebrate your birth. God, we are so thankful that you chose to come as a child, that one day you would give up your life for us, that you would be that perfect sacrifice for us, that we could have an abundant life, that we could have a right relationship with God through you, that there's nothing we can do on our own. It is only what you have already done. Help us to gravitate towards that. Help us to have that burned on our hearts and in our minds that it is only you. God, you are gracious and you are marvelous. You are wonderful. You are just. You are loving. You are kind. Help us to, to know that, to live it, and to express that to others. God, we're grateful for our time this morning as we've sung and as we've studied your word. God, may you be honored and glorified in our lives as we go this week. And I pray that as we go tomorrow to work, as we return to somewhat of life as normal, that you would help us to remember what it means to live an abundant life. Help us to remember what it means to recognize who you truly are. God, that people could see that inside of us that we could express that through our actions and through our words. God, we're grateful for you, and we're grateful for today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.